Welcome to Pure Hustle Podcast. I'm Mike. And this is Orlando on Warren episode 385, an update episode. That's right. 385 episodes in. And uh, Orlando, I don't know if you're uh, paying attention to the, uh, the date here, but it's Valentine's Day. It's uh, uh it's the it's it's the day of it's the day of love. It's the day of all of the you know the cheesy stuff. Uh, and so there's some people who love Valentine's Day. There's some people who hate it. There's heartbreak involved. It, it's one of those days. But here's what I want to say from Pure Hustle Podcast: We love all of you guys. We love you, our listeners. Uh, you guys are uh, amazing. So whether or not you're you're at home uh, alone listening tonight, listening to Pure Hustle Podcast, or uh, you're catching up on this because you went to a fancy uh, dinner with your Valentine, whatever the case is, just know that we here at Pure Podcast, we love you guys from our hey, heart. What, what's cracking me up right now internally is the irony of you saying whether you're home alone. Because when I thought about what you were just saying right now, I feel like we're, we're the hotel staff in Home Alone 2 when it's like, we love you. You know what I'm talking <laughs> we about? Love, yeah, yeah. Sure, that's what that's I feel fine. like we, we just, we, we just happened. <laughs> like, like the you audience know, is... Sometimes you got to be cheesy like that. It's good. We we do. We love you. And uh, and uh, but but honestly though, but legitimately, happy Valentine's Day. Whatever your situation is. Uh, but today we got more important things to talk about than than Cupid and arrows and hearts. We are talking about the new era of reselling. Uh, you you said it was an update episode, but this isn't an update episode. This is a themed episode, right? Oh, did I say update? I you did. That's themed. okay. There you go. See, uh, I'm updating you on the theme. That's right. And so this is an update to uh, our themes before. So because we've had the, you know, the state of reselling in 2023, 2024. And, you know, this past week in our conversations, you know, you and I had a, a good, healthy conversation about uh, going full time and what does it take and and, you know, all these different things. So it, it left me pondering, you know, I was thinking because we were, we were talking about the podcast and and I started thinking about we are really in a new era of reselling. And we've kind of touched on this a little bit, but I thought we really should, you know, go into the forest on this one. Uh, I don't know if that's the right analogy, but we really should go deep on this because I, I, I really do believe that our discussion today is going to cause people to think differently about what they've been doing in their reselling uh, business. You know, I want to say reselling game, but it's actually a business. Uh, I know for myself, I've had to adapt a lot. I've had to change a lot. And so I do think we're in a new era. I think what people were hoping for and expecting for was that maybe we'd get back to how things were 2016, 2018, 2019. It's interesting. Uh, you know, unfortunately, the 49ers uh, lost the Super Bowl. Uh, but the last Don't time remind I, me. I know the last time I personally owned the 49ers jacket was in 2019. And I, I wanted to I wanted to post something like uh, on Facebook, like, you know, Niner Gang or whatever. And luckily... I didn't because they lost. So, you know, I'm not going to get all the hate. But when I was scrolling through the pictures, I was looking at 2019 because I, I was I picked up that jacket, that Niners jacket from a Facebook marketplace buy for like 15 bucks. I went to uh, a tailor and they fixed the zipper on it for like 20, 30 bucks. And I resold the jacket like a year later for like 150 or something. And I got to wear it. But I was looking, you know, as I was looking for those pictures. I was looking at all the fines we had. I was looking at all the sales we had. I was looking at how, you know, I would go to the thrift stores almost every day. I was looking at how, you know, we would always pick up like the same things. Department 56. Uh, we'd always would uh, pick up Merrill shoes, you know, starter. Jack. It was like the same old, same old always. And and sales were good. They were continuous. They were, they were always happening. And I think a lot of people want to go back to that. I, I think a lot of resellers that started in 2020 don't know what we're talking about. But there was a very kind of a solid, I don't know, state of reselling back then. And now things have changed. But reselling is still good, but it's different. It is entirely different. And I don't think we are going back to, to the old way of doing things. I instead think that what we're going to talk about today is going to touch on how things are moving forward. And I think a lot of us, including myself, I'm going to have to get on board with some of this stuff. Uh, so before I move on too much, okay, so I broke this down into new sourcing new sellers and our and the last point here the discussion of new selling okay so new sourcing so when you sourced prior to 2020 mike what were you doing all right well real quick before i answer that question um 
one of the things that that I want to just kind of preface this episode on is is we sometimes get people who comment, and I'm not 100% sure how to read the comments um, as far as which way they're leaning on it, because sometimes comments can be ambiguous. But there's times people I feel think that we spend too much time talking about the past as if we're mm-hmm. we're just harping on the past. But what we're really trying to do is just say like, yeah, things are different. We don't expect things to go back to the way they were. And we do have to adjust and adapt and move forward. And so that's kind of what this episode is looking at is not just, oh, things have changed. What oh, was agreed. me? Yeah. But more of, yeah, things have changed. What was it like before? And how, how have things changed so that we can move forward? So it's not, this isn't a, us harping on the past. Uh, so, okay, again, back to your question. You said prior to 2020, how was I doing sourcing? Um, well, I mean, a lot of my sourcing was done at um, garage sales for the weekends. And then during uh, during the weekdays, I would stop at thrift stores. And it was pretty much guaranteed no matter what thrift store I stopped at, I would be you know profitable. I'd find a handful of items. I would typically stop on my way home from work. Um, I had the things I knew I was looking for, a few brands of shoes, a few brands of maybe some shirts or polos. I often spent a lot of time in the, the hard goods and, and electronic sections. Definitely picked up more electronics than I do now. Uh, but yeah, that would, that would probably be how I spent my time prior to 2019. Um, and then, yeah, since then, thrift stores got worse and then maybe have gotten better. We'll see. Yeah, and I think I think a lot of us could say the same. I mean, I was doing thrift stores like crazy. I was doing garage sales. I was doing local deals. Uh, the bins were around, and I'm going to talk about the bins a little bit. But the bins were not what they are now. So back then, there wasn't that many people at the bins, uh, and, and the the talk back then was that the bins got the leftovers of whatever did not sell in the thrift store, right? So a lot of people didn't go. I know here locally, a lot of people didn't go because. It just wasn't it just wasn't worth it because the best stuff was already picked through. And so people weren't going or a lot of people just didn't know. So you could go to the bins back then and there wasn't like the craziness that you see now. Right. Where it's like, you know, a bunch of a pack of animals attacking a bin, uh, trying to get stuff out the bins, shoving people out of the way. Like it, it wasn't like that back then. Uh, auctions, you know, there was live auctions. There was a lot more live auctions where you could go drive somewhere and people would bring out, you know, a pallet of stuff or a box or just an item. And you could, you know, you could do a live auction and there's some live auctions here in San Diego, but there's not many. And then at the same time, retail arbitrage was completely different. Uh, There were no cook groups. There was no bolo list. I mean, there might have been a few here and there, but, you know, pretty much the, the best way to find retail arbitrage at that time before all the bots and everything played a role was, you know, you grab your phone and you scan. Right. That was our advice. I think it was our advice up until 2021 was like, hey, go to the store scan two to 300 items and you can still do that. It's not, I'm not saying you can't do that, but you're already at a disadvantage, especially if it's a store that has the inventory online. If it's a store that they're disconnected with the online inventory, then you can still do it. And I still do that. I go to stores that I know that bots can't pick up what's in that store. And so I know I still have the advantage over others because I'm actually in the store while others are trying to look at other stores that don't have it, but things have changed. And I want to say there's two big factors, and I want to hear your thoughts on this, but I, I think the major change has been the bins and whatnot. Uh, we've already talked about how I, I do think the bins and whatnot have brought deflation into the resale market where costs have gone, uh, not cost, prices have gone down a lot on items. And it's just because people have been able to get items for a lot cheaper, where before you'd have to go to the thrift, right? You pay, you know, five bucks for a shirt and you'd have to, you know, at least sell it for 20 to 30 for it to be worth your time where now you go to yeah. the bins and you get it for pennies on the dollar and you're okay flipping it for 10, 15, 20 bucks because yeah. Hey, it's a, it's a good profit. Yeah. I, I would say a, a big part of that shift um, was 2020 was a big year in the sense of more and more people spent a lot of time online uh, that led to big booms in, um, you know, people doing retail arbitrage or people doing the bins, people doing that type of stuff and showing how to do it on TikTok or showing how to do that on Instagram. Mm-hmm. And there was a huge influx of, I remember when TikTok first started and then we started seeing like, some of them were kind of scammy, like young guys going like, look, I'm going to Ross and I'm, you know, mm-hmm. I pay this much and I get these. And and it was kind of, you know, we knew as, as resellers, like, okay, there is some truth. You can make this kind of money, but they're also not, you know, calculating in the, all of the other costs and fees and shipping and all that. So they're kind of giving skewed numbers. But what that did is that influx of people trying to like boost their their hustle culture type videos 
is it opened up a lot of people to the fact that things like the bins existed. Now, I, I firmly believe there are a ton of resellers who were doing well at the bins long before reselling or uh, oh, yeah. the reselling Instagram and, and TikTok stuff really blew up or even YouTube. Um, but I think that it, it kind of just shined a light on a, on a market, right? It's like if you find something like you find a good bolo and then all of a sudden a cook group gets it and then now that bolo is kind of dropped off in the same way. Um, you're bringing a ton of people. And then even if they're not like legitimate, like hardcore resellers who are going to figure this out and stay long term, if you've got a revolving door of young 18 to 25 year olds who've just seen a few TikToks, so they know that a handful of brands and they're going to the bins or they maybe even don't know any brands, but they're just buying like they're just shoveling their carts full of stuff. What that does is that leaves less for everybody else. It's almost like a gold rush, you know, like the California gold rush. Everybody starts coming. Everybody's trying to pan for gold. And in some ways, it's like who made the most money in, in that time? It's a lot of times it was the people who were selling the deeds, the people who were selling the supplies for doing the 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 panning for gold and not the the gold diggers themselves. And, and it's kind of like that. A lot of people made, you know, social media money off social media. I will teach you how to do this. I'll give you the secret. And so even though a lot of that has died off and a, a lot of people, you know, like I said, it's a revolving door. I think a lot of the people who get into it, they, they leave it. They don't stay around. But just that influx of people has, like you said, caused some kind of a deflation in the market. Lots of prices going down because people are trying to offload this stuff that, you know, they're paying 30 cents a pound or whatever they're paying for it. So, yeah, why not just offload it as cheap as I can? Then when they realize, like, man, I'm working for $17 an hour at this point. Is this really worth it? Um, you know, then it falls off. But the damage has been done. The prices have dropped uh, and new people are jumping in. So I don't think I see. I don't think it's falling off. Like I think people are okay working for 17, $20 an hour. As long as they don't have to answer anybody, as long as it get to manipulate their own hours. Uh, you know, it, it, to me, I, I, what I, what I'm seeing, this is what I'm seeing is I think the bins are a great place to be right now. I think if you want to get that competitive edge over, over, a lot of resellers, a lot of OG resellers like myself now that I consider myself OG, even though I've only been reselling uh, for 10 years and six years full time. Uh, I, I do think those individuals that have bins nearby, that they are they have the upper hand on things because I there's no way I can compete with somebody that's selling things for 50 percent less than I'm selling it because they're always going to get that sale and their cost of goods is way lower. So I do encourage people you know, to do. And, and what I've noticed, too, with the bins is that back then it was like clothing right it was clothing it was maybe shoes but i'm seeing uh, and, and i will talk about tiktok in a moment here but on tiktok i see a lot of people they're going and they're finding sealed video games and now it could be they're planting stuff okay i'll give it but i don't think it is they're finding sealed video games they're finding vintage toys they're finding electronics in there they're finding uh you know vcr players in there they're finding like all this stuff that was not really in the bins. There were there was a section of hard goods in the bins earlier on, but it wasn't like that big. It was it wasn't like it was pretty scarce what you'd find in there. You know, a lot of stuff would be broken. But now the thrift stores, like I've said in other podcasts, I think they're overwhelmed with inventory and they've realized they can't sell it all online. So now they've been shifting everything to the bins. And I think that's created a lot of opportunity for a lot of people. And so I, I encourage, you know, people to just try out once. It doesn't mean it has to be for everyone. I myself, it's not for me. But if if there's one that opens up nearby, which there has been rumor of one, another one opening in San Diego, I may go there. And, you know, if it goes well, I may be a regular. I, I, I don't know. But I, I will say I've had to change things up because I've had to compete uh, with the, you know, the people that are going, you know, two or three times a day to the bins and selling that stuff really fast. Uh, because the w the amount that they are listing, I can't compete with because they're they're listing really quick. They're selling it really quick, and it's just moving at a different velocity. And uh, the other one is is whatnot. <clears throat> and a lot of people say, you know, a lot of our listeners in the comments always say they're not sourcing on whatnot, but there are a lot of people sourcing on whatnot right now. Uh, they I think they're carrying a lot of resellers right now. Uh, and again, because they're getting those not necessarily bin, but they're getting less than thrift store prices. Uh, kind of around garage sale prices, depending on what it is. And so I, I really think it's changed the market. And I encourage people, you know, it, it doesn't hurt to check out one night every once in a while. I know a lot of people don't want to wait for things and that's okay. Then if that's not your thing, it's not your thing. But if you're busy, you know, selling, you know, listing things, packing items, 
you know, after you're done putting Pure the Podcast in the background, you can go to Whatnot and put a Whatnot auction on the background. You know, it may it may be worth it to you. So, uh, remember Reeftail Arbitrage, Mike? Remember those dolls? Yeah, man, I, I definitely remember going and uh, and buying lots of stuff. Uh, uh, some sold, some didn't sell. Um, yeah, retail arbitrage was something I did a lot more before. Now, like you said, um, it's still something that I'll occasionally do. Uh, but but again, a lot of times now that you can do, um, you know, curbside pickup, if you find a good deal, the hard part is most other people kind of figure out that same deal at the same time. And so uh, the prices drive down. But yeah, there's a lot of times if, if you could just see what stores have it in stock, you throw it in your cart, you buy it. We've done that a few times with things at Walmart or Target. And we get, you know, however many we can get at that store. There's a handful of stores in our area. We go pick those up. Uh, but you don't even have to leave your car most of the time now. Now, there's still going to be those chase items that I feel like are, you know, you probably have to go into the store to get. Like, you know, if it's a PlayStation 5, when those are, you know, almost impossible to get, you're probably going to have to go in to get an item like that at the right time, be in the right place at the right time. Uh, but yeah, I, I definitely think retail arbitrage uh, has has changed due to the online nature. Now, again, that's a, that's a plus and a negative, right? So... There's negative to that, but then there's a positive of, again, you're not having to to leave your house. You can check to see what's available. And then um, it almost opens up um, the ability to scan other aisles for other things, you know, that, that aren't necessarily the big hits. You could still go into a store. You might be better off going to, like you said, the stores that are disconnected from the online side. Uh, it's like places that have run over stuff, you know, the the... TJ Maxx, the Marshalls, the Ross, that kind of stuff. Um, or, um, you know, those places might be one aspect to go. And then the other thing is, if everybody else is doing the online thing, getting the the fingerlings or whatever the new hot item is on on online, uh, you just know you're not looking for those in the store. You're looking for the other things to that you might need to, to look for. Yeah, and I would make the argument even stronger that if you want to do retail arbitrage, you have to join a group. You have to join a cook group. You have to join a group that has bots. Uh, for multiple reasons. One, if anything is online, those bots have scanned the entire store. So there's no point in going in and scanning. There just isn't because somebody's already done that multiple times. Uh, now, if you disagree with me, let me know in the comments. Maybe I'm missing something. But like a Target, a Walmart, uh, all those stores, like th they've already been run through. Like they are, there's already programs out there. Can't remember the program I was using a couple years ago uh, when I was trying to do more online arbitrage, but. It was something where it would run the, you would give the parameters. I can't remember what it was, but you'd give the parameters like, hey, I want to make 20% profit after fees on every item. And it would run the entire store and it would give me a bunch of items that I could go look out for. But now things have been taken with another step with the bots. Now they will buy those items, right? So those items, like as soon, they'll, they'll have scanning and whatever store has them, they'll buy it and then it sells out really quick. Or if it's a drop, like let's say it's a Stanley mug or or whatever it is, those bots are going to buy those right away. Okay, it, it's, now, it's some stores I have seen, though, um, where I've tried to buy things like that, like I get a, a hot tip. I'm not in any cook groups or anything, but I'll yeah. get a hot tip on an item. I'll, I'll try and get it. But then you'll see sometimes on on Walmart, for, for instance, where it'll say like no longer available for online purchase. But the no, store still has some. So sometimes they will cut those off um, to open it up for people who are in the store. So you potentially could still snag those. But again, you, you're potentially looking at a race for the bottom. But the crazy thing with those bots is sometimes they'll have like a two limit order. Like Target does this a lot. But what they'll do is those bots will just create multiple accounts and buy and buy and buy and buy and buy. And, buy. and then the group will distribute or whatever, whatever way they do it. Um, but I, I personally know many people that are in many of those groups. And like, for example, Supreme back in the I do people still sell supreme drops I don't do they even happen know. anymore I don't know but I remember back in the day even when I was teaching I would have you know I think it was I forget what day it was Thursday or whatever eight o'clock a.m whatever time it was and I'd have students in class with their phones ready to buy items right even with the Nike shoe drops they would have to be ready and I you know I was I understood the game so I kind of let them do it I, as long as they paid attention to the rest of class I probably shouldn't admit to that and sometimes they would get in sometimes they not now you have zero chance like maybe you'll get entered in a Nike shoe drop raffle. Uh, maybe you'll have another opportunity. Maybe, you know, there'll be a fluke. But chances are if you really want to do retail arbitrage. You're going to have to step up uh, your technology. You're going to have to either join a group and get it by yourself, figure out some way 
uh, that you can be more efficient at purchasing and picking up items. And so I do think we're not, there's no turning back from that. I think, I think we are there All right now. Local sourcing though. Do you feel like that's changed? You do a lot of local stuff. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I feel like when I first started local sourcing, Craigslist was kind of the big thing. And then offer up Facebook marketplace was kind of just kind of coming into its own. People were starting to do that more. Uh, but I feel like, people were more willing to just let things go. And maybe it's a generational thing. Maybe people weren't as aware of prices on stuff. So uh, I feel like it was easier to snag lower prices even just a couple of years ago. Now I feel like most people who are selling on those platforms, they kind of have an idea what things are worth. And, and it could just be the um, the tech savviness of those who are starting to sell on those platforms. They kind of realize like, hey, I'm selling these Pokemon cards. I'm selling these shoes. I'm selling this video game i'm selling whatever item it is that they have that i'm looking for these dungeons and dragon books and people are kind of just looking up like what are other people selling theirs for what are these worth and they kind of list high now the nice thing is you still have the ability for some negotiation people can have things listed for a while they don't sell you negotiate down uh, but i feel like a couple of years ago it was a little bit easier to just find things and part of that might have been there was less people buying on those platforms as well so people were pricing a little bit more competitively um, now I feel like you still can have some luck like on Craigslist with that because I feel like the people who are still using Craigslist tend to not be as like, I'm going to spend the time to look up what all this is worth uh, because I feel like on Facebook Marketplace or OfferUp, it's a younger crowd who are a little bit more like, no, I know what this is worth. I know how to look up what this mm -hmm. is worth. I want to get what it's worth also because, you know, again, it could be a generational thing, not just with tech savviness, but um, with need. You know, as as you get older, naturally, you tend to make more money in your life and your expenses oftentimes go down as you get into like your older years, your kids start to graduate, they're out of the house, you're making the most you've ever made in your life and your expenses have gone down because your house is paid off and you don't have kids. So those people are less worried about making top dollar, whereas a lot of the people who are on offer up Facebook marketplace are in their 20s, 30s, 40s. And it's like, man, I need this money. And so uh, I, I've noticed it's gone a little bit harder uh, but, you know, you could still do things like uh, save searches. You can still kind of, um, you know, figure out ways to find good products. You just have to be a little bit more active. Yeah, And, you know, there's some advantages there. Like, for ex example, offer up. You can you can pay to get things hours before everybody else. I don't know. They can. They also say they control the messages like that. You get messages sooner. So I wonder if that's what happened with your Facebook situation a few weeks ago or maybe you know or your facebook message you replied to somebody and then you didn't hear back from them for several hours and then the item sold during that time but then you looked and your message actually was replied to you just didn't see it so yeah. I, I but i do know like on offer up they have a service where you can pay and you can't get things ahead of time i think google lens has changed a lot of uh, what's going on uh, that's the ability with google to use images and you just take a picture or something and then it'll find uh, other images on the internet and what they're going for, not what they sold for, what they're going for. And I think that's changed a lot. I I mean, even myself, when I source locally, like I hardly ever will go out and inspect the item. The only time I'll go out and inspect an item is if I'm trying to get a better deal. So just a tip for you. Uh, sometimes it's not best to, you know, message somebody on offer up or whatever and go, you know, hey, I know you have for 200. Would you take 150? Because right away, the technology makes it easy for them to just decline it. But if you go, hey, you know, I, I saw your item. I was interested. Is there a time I can stop by? It's easier to do the negotiation because you show up, you have the cash in hand and you're, you're, you know, you're saying, hey, I really want to buy this, but this is where I'm at. I find that people are more willing to work with you. I get denied all the time on offer up and I've kind of stopped doing the whole, you know, I, I always push for as little as I can when I make those deals. And uh, I I always get no's and no's and no's. Uh, but now I've, I, if it's something that I really want to get, I'd rather just show up and go, you know, well, here's my re rationale. If we can't make a deal, it's okay. But hey, I drove out here. My car's right there. I got cash in hand. Do you want to make a deal? Yeah. We can make a deal. And if you don't, that's okay too. Yeah. I mean, that's a good tip. I mean, you got to be confident in your negotiating, not even just negotiating ability, but your um, ability, your willingness for there to be some awkwardness because... I feel like sometimes you might get the, the mindset of like, hey, I'm coming out here. They have this thing listed for 150. I, I asked to meet up with them and now I'm offering them 100. Like, am I kind of, you are kind of putting them in a weird position because it's like they might have been thinking 150. 
But again, like you said, um, you know, going back to the little house on the prairie uh, analogy, one of the things, the phrases that were used was cash on the barrel, right? Like I'm only going to buy cash on the barrel. And it's like that, that money talks, you know, and, and I've done that before where I've negotiated a lower deal um, on the spot, like one time for a trailer. And the guy was like, uh, you know, like I have other people mentioning, you know, that they'd pay me more, but you're here and you have the money. And so it's at that point, it's really that is the next guy going to flake on me? Am I w- willing to meet up with another person or I could just get the money now? And so, and like you said, they could say no, but again, you have to be willing to put yourself in a little bit of an awkward position um, until you get comfortable with, with, you know, asking, asking for a lower price. Yeah, no, I, I just, you know, a real life example is there's a lot of a bunch of stuff, uh, which is one of my bolos lately that I, I don't share publicly because I don't want to kill my own market, but um, they had it up for 200 and I typically offer 50%. <laughs> and so I offered a 50% crickets, didn't hear anything. And then, you know, yesterday in the middle of the Super Bowl, it sold. And I was like, ah, you know, I should have just said, hey, can I stop by? Because at least if I got that, they could have been like, hey, you know, well, you know, I, I don't want to go any lower than this number. And I could have maybe met them at the number or I could have met them at the place. Instead, I just lost out on that deal. And I probably would have made really good money on that deal. And I had others. I've had video game things where, you know, I, I think I think there's a lot to be said about going to a place, you know, using your charisma or as the kids say, risen things a little bit here, you know, uh, and and using your, your ability to negotiate to get that better deal. Because sometimes it's like texting. It's sometimes not best to text people. Sometimes it's not best to email people. Sometimes it's just better to get on the phone and talk to people. And I would say even on Craigslist, uh, I find that I always beat out people because <laughs> no offense to you, Mike, but millennials and Gen and Gen Zers do not like talking on the phone. And so I will call somebody and they're like, you know, I had this younger guy, but he kept wanting to text me. You called me. Let's make that deal. And I've had that happen over and over and over again. And now I've just killed my whole market. But, you know, just I, I, I strongly recommend that there are still local deals to be made. Just make sure you do that. And, you know, use Google Lens. Save yourself time. Right. Don't let me don't say I'm on, proud of you for I'm proud of you for using the uh, the actual name of it. Google Lens and not Google Images. Good job. <laughs> You've you corrected grown. me so many times. <laughs> I know. I, I, listen, I'm only Gen X. OK, I'm not that old. All right. All right. Hey, one thing that has definitely has changed in reselling in the last few years is the use of my reseller genie. It is an amazing, amazing uh, technology that allows you to be able to import all your eBay fees, all your shipping fees, all your promoted listing fee, whatever fees you need. But it's it's almost getting to tax time. And some of you may be stressing. Maybe you had a great 2023 year. And you're like, how how can I get my taxes done so I'm not getting killed in taxes? My Reseller Genie is a great tool that help you import all those items. They also help you bookkeep throughout the year by keeping track of your profit and loss. Also being able to see, you know, how much you paid for something and how much it sold. It's just a great tool. And Mike, we failed again. I failed. We were supposed to announce the winner of this podcast. Oh, man. So we will next week, next week. Now, if you want to be part of this contest and you want to get a free month of my reseller genie, just leave a comment. If you leave a comment, you will be entered for the month of February next week. I'm, I'm putting a note right now on my phone uh to do this okay so next we will announce the winner from january and uh you get a free month on my reseller genie now if you want to get my reseller genie right now because you know chance of you winning you know it, they're high because you know there's not we don't have like lotto number kind of people applying but uh you get a free month uh not a free month sorry you get 15 percent off 15 percent off the first month by using our code pure hustle in the link below and that's going to help you get ready for your taxes but leave a comment too so you can get answered in the contest all right so reselling new sellers now a lot of people are hesitant about this how have you have you been catching any of the new sellers on there i i'm not gonna name drop name drop but have you seen any of the newer videos out there you mean like on social media yeah yeah or yeah on youtube or whatever yeah i i i actually i've talked about this before um 
I tend to consume more content that's not reselling related um, and I, that's starting to shift. I'm, I'm trying to take reselling a little bit, not just more seriously, but I'm trying to learn some more niches and stuff. So I, I'm I actually I'm finding that there's a lot of people who have way more knowledge than I do, obviously, but uh, that that are kind of newer upstart people. And so uh, I have started watching a few more like Insta reels and things like that. Uh, so there's definitely a lot of new YouTubers. In fact, uh, when we started uh, the podcast, um, there were a handful of, of eBay and reselling YouTubers. Um, there were several on on social media, but yeah, it's definitely become so much more. It's like amazing to see like how many new people, and maybe they've been around for longer than I've realized. But it's like, man, there's some people with huge followings. It's like, where did these this guy come from? Where did this lady come from? Uh, yeah, there's definitely a lot more uh, resellers on social media for sure, and on like the YouTube and Instagram and that type of stuff. And I think there's a lot of fresh content out there. Now, you should keep listening to Pure as a podcast, okay? I'm not talking about us, but I feel that a lot of these new resellers, have they're invigorated. They have, you know, they're, they're ready to go. They got that hustle of, of many people that started YouTube a few years ago. And they're dropping all kinds of bolos, like stuff I would have never thought about. Uh, you know, because we've all done the clothing stuff and... And, you know, the, the typical bolos, the typical shoe bolos, typical electronic bolos. But now there, there is a whole branch of new resellers that are just sharing completely different things that I, I wouldn't think about. And so I encourage people that have been reselling for a while that kind of have tuned out all the other, you know, outside of Peers of Podcast, you've tuned out all the other YouTubers and all the other resellers because you're like, oh, it's the same old info or I kind of got tired of them. Listen to this new group. They actually know what they're talking about. Uh, they Their big thing right now is sell-through rate. And so I think they're very effective because not only are they sharing what sells for good money, but they're sharing what sells quickly, right? So I'll give you an example. I'm just going to throw out there because it's already been out there, but like Adidas Samba shoes. I've seen many of them say those. I've never, ever picked one up. I never even would have thought about picking one up. And the other day, you know, I, I picked one up and within 24 hours sold. Right. And and I'm like, wow, this is crazy. Like things I would never look at. Right. Uh, new Balance shoes. Right. People are picking up new. But I would never pick up New Balance shoes until maybe the last year. OK. Um, you know, I'm not trying to drop all these kind of bows here. But, you know, even like when I think of like kitchen stuff, like there's some kitchen stuff that I never, never would have thought there would be any money in these kitchen items. And now I'm like, I think I'm going to pick these up because I'm seeing these. So I encourage you guys. You know, I, I know a lot of people would like to stay to the tried and true. Uh, don't leave our, our podcast, but do go explore because I, I do think there's a lot of new ideas that are out there with new bolos and definitely, you know, they, they know what they're talking about. I mean, you know, I think a lot of people forget that reselling doesn't take a long time to be good. Like I, I, I'm of the argument that to be in like, like top tier, I do think it takes a few years, but to be really good at like finding items and selling and being profitable I think it just takes a few months of big consistency, like constantly thrifting, constantly sourcing, constantly listing. And I think people can can learn really quick if they really try. And a lot of these younger guys, and I feel old saying this, but, you know, these guys, I realized the other day when I was talking to one of the guys from the flood company that was in my house, you know, they're, they're working and we're just, you know, shooting the breeze. And and I talk, I'm talking to the guy and trying to give him some uh, wise advice from an old man. And he's like, I'm like, so, bro, so what do you, you know, how old are you? He's like, I'm 20. I'm like, what? I am. I could have had you as a, I could have had you as my son. Like, this is crazy. And sometimes we're, we're, we easily discount uh, the younger generation. But I do think this new group of resellers in their 20s, uh, you know, early 30s. Mike, I think you're, you're in the latter 30s now, maybe. Um Mid-30s. I think they have a lot of knowledge. Mid mid thirties. Okay, okay. Sorry. Mid thirties. Sorry, don't, don't tell me. Yeah, <laughs> I'm still a young guy. All right, now we're all still young. The other side, and, and I'll stop talking here. Is that I think a lot of a lot of people this bothers a lot of people, but I did, do think this new group of resellers they are selling items for a lot less. But I'm okay with it. You know what? What do you think? You think they're making a bad move by selling it for less? Um. I don't know. I feel like it's one of those things where, um, you know, sometimes people have to one, it's like less for who, right? Like if they're making a profit, they're making okay. a profit. Um, and then also a lot of times they're, they're trying to, you're trying to find what works. You're trying to find your niche. And a lot of, 
a lot of businesses do that, right? Like a lot of businesses, um, they start off by selling at a loss or just not making as much because they're trying to build their reputation. They're trying to build their store. And I don't think it's a bad thing. I think the hard part is it's not sustainable long term. Um, and so, and again, uh, you know, if you're a new reseller and you're trying to build up a, a, your reputation as a store, you're trying to get your feedback. And so you're selling things a little bit less or you're just trying to make some money. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, and I think maybe that's on us too to adapt because maybe that's just the prices of things. Like maybe we were used to being able to sell things when there wasn't as much competition. And so um, I'll, I'll never forget. I don't remember who it was, the name of the person, but we we had an interview with somebody and uh, it was a husband and wife team. You'll know Orlando. Um, I'll remember as soon as you say their name. Uh, but they're, they were fast nickel and their whole thing was they'd, they'd go to a thrift store and everything would be listed and sold within that month. Right. Oh, the amazing part, taste store. Yeah. Amazing taste store. That's what it was. Um, so yeah, I mean, just thinking of like an, a deal like that, of like that graded against our old school thinking of like, I'm just going to list it and forget it and list it high. And eventually it's going to sell to the right buyer as opposed to look, if I've got this, um, and it, and I see a lot of them are selling for 20 bucks on eBay, I'm going to list it for 18 because I want this gone and I want to move on to the next thing. Yeah. What's wrong with that? Yeah. And I, I think the Amazon effect has happened. Uh, we can call it race to the bottom, <laughs> which is the same thing. But I think what's happened is the, this new batch of resellers, uh, what they've realized is that they can make the sale quicker by just undercutting uh, everybody. And, and yes, I do think it's not sustainable over a long while, depending on what category you're in. But that's just the way it is. I see it all the time. I see it. TikTok is the place to see a lot of this stuff. You're not going to see it a lot on, on Instagram or Facebook. Uh, you are going to see on TikTok where people are like, oh, I picked this up and I saw comps at 200. I want to sell this quick. And so I'm going to sell it for 180. Or, you know, I saw that they're charging too much on shipping. Uh, you know what? I'm going to I'm going to sell it for 25 percent less because I'm going to I just want to get that quick sale. And yeah, that'll bring a lot of people doing that will bring the market down. But this is kind of where we're at right now. Uh, people have found that, you know, they want to get their money quick. They want to cash flow. They want to. You know, a lot of these individuals are at the bins and so they want to sell through everything in one day so they can have cash. Not that they're going to get it instantly the next day, but they want to have that cash flow constantly happening so they can buy and sell, buy and sell, buy and sell, buy and sell. And there have been some resellers that have been doing that for a long time that, you know, I've been around the reselling space. But I find that it's, it's very prevalent now for, you know, somebody to look at comps where I would look at comps back in the day and I would match the highest prices sold for. Where now people are like, uh, no, we're not doing that. <laughs> we're actually not even selling at the lowest price. We're going like a few percentage less than the lowest price. And I know in the comments, people will will talk about how annoying that is. And it may be, but that's the reality of things. Like everybody has their own reality. And, and if they're able to stay profitable, they're going to sell it at what price they can. And this next one, I do think social media is, is going to be huge in reselling. I think we already saw it. I think K-Way Shop, uh, Wayne, uh, introduces many people to that world. I know a lot of people don't like it. I know a lot of people are adverse to it, but I think that's just the reality of reselling. I think social media is going to play a huge role. Uh, do you think there's, there's still the ability to be super profitable as a reseller uh, without social media? Um, I think... I think there's the ability to be profitable without having a social media presence of your own. Um, I think you you maybe it's a different game to play, right? Like doing it that way, where you're you're trying to build an audience, you're trying to be successful and whatnot, you're trying to do that. But I think not using social media as a learning tool, not using social media as an option for like learning new niches and learning new things, I think you're 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 only hurting yourself, right? Like you're locking yourself into like here's the one thing I know because no matter what, like I, again, I always think of like my friend who like sells RC airplanes, like that's his thing. He sells RC airplanes, he buys RC airplanes. He is deeply, deeply in that hobby. Like he goes to conventions, he goes and hangs out with people, he flies the planes, with people. He's on the forums, so that's his social media, right? Like he's on the forums, he's learning what new models are coming out. He's learning like, oh, like this old model, like there's a way to fix this, and there's so he's he's learning that niche. So even that, um, he's not frozen. It's not like he learned one set of you know things that sell and then he's stuck there. So the same thing is true, especially for those of us who are the uh, the. What, what do we, we call us like garage sale sellers where like our stores are kind of everything is you really do need to to utilize social media um 
I, I've been spending a little bit more time watching some whatnot auctions, watching some pe- uh, videos of people shopping at the bin, shopping at thrift stores. Cause I'm like, Oh, that's a brand. Uh, I didn't realize that brand sold. And Oh, like that's, that, that's the specific thing that makes that brand sold. This guy just told me that like, if it has this part on the logo or, or if you pick them up and they have this color, then they sell better or this size sells better. And those are things I wouldn't have known. I learned a lot of that. And in, in the beginning, by going out thrifting with you, you were showing me what was in your cart. But if you're just the everyday person, who's showing you what's in their cart? Who's showing you, oh, I picked this up for this reason. Well, the beautiful thing about social media is you get to learn from those people, even though they're not right there with you. Um, I even look at that like one of the best things you can do as a person is have a mentor. And it's really hard to find good mentors and people who are willing to pour into your life. But if you're willing to pick up a book, man, you could have any any famous person that's written a book in, in or a a person that books have been written about as your mentor. Right. And the same thing is true. Like right now with things that are changing, because like the reselling world is a changing space is you can have mentors right now if you're on social media. So I absolutely think you you need social media to learn and grow. Um, and that's, and maybe it's not specifically social media. Like maybe it's like, well, in my niche, it's this random forum or it's this random, you know, Facebook group, or it's this random, you know, whatever, but you need to have something. You need to be connected to some kind of community for sure. Yeah, I agree. And the other one I will add is you can make a lot of sales from social media. You know, I, you even, you know, before they get to eBay, before you list them, everything. And, and I think a lot of people are leveraging that, you know, whether it be on whatnot, I, I've seen a lot of people, even from our own discord that now are, you know, they'll go sourcing on Instagram or they'll go sourcing, you know, they'll do a TikTok live. And as they're sourcing, people are asking them like, hey, are you willing to sell that item? And sure, why not? Why wouldn't you sell it at that point in time? You don't have to pay for fees. You know, you're not going to have to deal with with returns because they also are following you. So, you know, and you're going to make sure that you send out something that's legitimate. And so it all works out. And so I encourage people, you know, don't ignore the side of social media. Recently, I know there's this thing like, hey, you know, those people that make money from social media and because of the, you know, they sell to their followers, they're not real resellers. I think that conversation has changed. I think now those individuals are the new resellers. This is where we're at now and, and things have changed drastically. All right, one thing that has not changed since the beginning, but if they have changed, it's been for the better. It's American Bubble Boy. Their great prices haven't changed. Their fast delivery hasn't changed, but they have new products. Uh, they have their tape that you can still use our code Pure Hustle and get 5% off already a great price. I've heard rumor too that the boxes are coming one day. I don't know. Did you see that in the Discord? Uh-uh. I, somebody was talking about it on the Discord. I'm like, we are so disconnected. Like, I talk to Joel every once in a while. I haven't talked to him in a while, in a while the owner of American Bubble Boy, but that may be coming down the pike. Uh, and, you know, now that I am selling a lot more hard goods, I'm using a lot more bubble wrap. And I love the fact that right now I can order it and I know it'll get to me by Thursday at the latest. Sometimes I end up getting the next day. So if you haven't checked out American Bowl Boy, uh, please do so. Uh, Just go to the link below so they know that we sent you. You know, we get a little bit of, uh, you know, kickback from that. And it also gives you a great price on an item. So make sure to check out American Bowl Boy. And also, as we as I mentioned on the Discord, (laughs) what I love is on the Discord is all new bolos all new people, all new resellers. I mean, there's there's people in there that have been reselling for 20 years and there's people that have been reselling for the last two years and both sides have brought a ton of knowledge. Uh, we also have had some retail arbitrage drops lately, uh, some bolos on that end. We have uh, individuals that are selling Amazon. So if you want to help us out on the podcast side and, and let us know that you appreciate the podcast and help us keep the lights on uh, for five fifty five a month on Patreon, you can help us out and that gives you access to our discord and as always if you want to contact us you can always contact us uh, via phone 619-73-1170 or by email at peersapodcast at gmail.com you can also help us out by coming over to youtube if you're listening and hit that subscribe button Uh, my goal is to be at 10k by the summer and i know that's a lot but if everybody just came over and just subscribed we'd have it we'd have 10k on here and uh, last, and you know, also grateful for all the iTunes reviews that we get. They're always great, even 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 the bad ones. It allows us to think about things. And last of all, if you're trying to follow us on social media, we are Pierzo Cast on all platforms, and we are Pierzo Cast on Twitter. All right, let's talk about some crazy, crazy finds here. All right, come on, hustlers! It's the freaking hustle of the week. 
Yeah, hustle of the week. All right, our first one comes from Robert. Uh, Instagram handle is at hustler by design. Uh, so went to a sale of a guy that has been mostly in the business of cleanouts for fifty years. Uh, picked up two of these along with a Holt uh, Howard pitcher and mug set and some Santa Claus face items. So, anyways. Got all of this stuff for $15. So the, the thing that we sold, what the actual hustle was, was sold a mid-century Holt Howard Santa King wall pocket for $500. And a second one priced up more and took an offer for $700. Holy smokes. Yeah, that's pretty wild. And again, it's 15 from to like reseller. 1000 Yeah. Yeah, it, it's pretty crazy. So... You know, fifteen to five hundred, and then the seven hundred. And and if and if you look these up, these Howard. I mean, you go check out his Hustler by Design website, uh, Instagram. Uh, they're easily missed. They they I I they kind of look like you know those things that you buy like for decoration at like TJ Maxx or what is that TJ Maxx store? The Home Country. What is it called? Home Goods. Home Goods. Home Goods. Yeah, it kind of looks like something you would buy from there, right? Not worth much, but yeah, these were worth a ton. So nice work there, Robert. All right, next one comes from Dave from the Discord. Okay, bought a Christmas ornament at the store that shall not be named a few days ago for a dollar ninety nine. Figured it wouldn't sell until Christmas twenty twenty four, but it sold. Sold a Christopher Radko Angelic Ascent ornament listed at one hundred and thirty nine ninety five plus shipping and accepted an offer of one hundred fifteen plus ship. So it turned a dollar ninety nine to one hundred fifteen plus ship. You can't beat that, Dave. Nice work. Uh, Christmas sells year round. That's right. All right. Our next one, this says it's an update to a previous hustle of the week. So uh, this comes from Jacob Gutsorum on Instagram. It says, hello, I didn't know exactly where to send in a hustle of the week message, but I went to a storage unit yesterday with a lot of boxes outside of the unit on tables and on the ground, plus some inside the unit on shelves. The people there said all the boxes inside and outside of the unit unit were fair game. So I started digging. On the outside of the unit, I found some old sealed calculators, a few vintage shirts, some old books, and a sealed Bluetooth headphone along with a few other odds and ends. Then I went inside the unit to go through the boxes in there. In there, in plain sight, was a 49ers Apex Pro-Line jacket sitting in the open that surprisingly no one had grabbed yet. So I grabbed that and kept looking. Then at the back of the unit, under other boxes, I found two boxes full of sealed sports card boxes and Pokemon cards from 2009. I remember this. I immediately grabbed everything and went to pay. I paid 90 for everything. I valued everything with my wife, and I think the eBay value is around $7,000. Uh, so here's the update. So far, I've sold about $1,600 worth of Pokemon cards and around $1,200 worth of other cards from $90. Yeah, I know. Jeez. And again, a, a reseller selling to another reseller. You know, I, a lot of people discount that. But you listen, I got a guy that cleans out storage units and he does garage sales. I would say about every two weeks. And he's just offloading stuff for cheap. So I definitely encourage everyone, you know, if you see another reseller, that doesn't necessarily mean you're not going to be able to make money on that sale. So nice work. Appreciate the update there. Uh from Jacob Gutterson on Instagram. All right, what is your hustle of the week? All right, so my hustle of the week was um, I talked about like the 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 Disney Infinity um, little figurines. I think last week or a couple weeks ago. Uh, anyways, my wife and I were at a, a thrift store a while back, and she found a um, it was an open box, but everything was inside of it of a Disney Infinity. Um, Marvel, I know it was Star Wars. It was Disney Infinity Star Wars set. So it came with the game. It came with like two or three figures and it came with like the little stand they go on. And she, she only paid like $5 for it. Um, somewhere four to five bucks. It wasn't a lot. And I checked it. I made sure everything was still in there. Uh, the game was actually still sealed. So I sold it as um, open box, like new open box. Everything's in there. Took pictures of everything. And it sold for uh, just over $50. So nice. from $5, $50 plus, it's exciting because it was a, a find my wife found. So when I said it sold, I said, you sold your uh, your game. So and that always makes her excited. So that was a good one. What about you? you go. So I went to a garage sale a few months ago and it was a lady that was selling stuff for a family. Like, I guess they didn't want to deal with it, but they said, hey, if you want to make some profit, you can sell some of her stuff. 
And so I, I went around and and the moment she told me that I was like, I could probably get a good deal because she she just wants to offload this stuff. So I bought a few baseball bats, made a ton of money on the baseball bats, bought a few other items. But and then in the corner was this vintage baby doll who was balding. Okay. And so missing some hair, looked really grungy. I mean, it, it looked like something from like a horror movie. And I and I I looked up comps. And, you know, it was worth like 100 to 200 bucks. So I asked her, I'm like, hey, what about what about this baby doll here? And she goes, what? Just get rid of it. Take it. I don't care. And I'm like, what? What? What's the big deal? She's like, oh, that thing scares me. And so I was like, why does it scare you? And so let me see if I can play the audio. Let's see if it'll pick up on the. Let's see. Could you hear that, Mike? Yeah, I think you played this one for us before, didn't you? Did. Yeah, that's weird. Okay, so it is it is a, a vintage Mattel uh, baby secret whisper doll with the pull string. Oh, yeah, sorry, I did talk about this when I sourced it. And so I paid $5 for it, and it sold for $225 plus ship <laughs> to a good home. Yeah. yeah, I'm sure you probably could have sold it for more if you like listed it as a haunted doll. I'm telling you, man, if you if you just eBay some like haunted doll stuff, man, there's some weird people. People are very creative with the stories they make for those. It's uh, it's yeah. interesting. It was it what was wild about it is that like it is like there was other dolls like this, but in better condition. But mine looked like it had been through a lot. So I think mm. that's that's why that it helped. It helped. <laughs> I, think, I do think it helps. So, hey, appreciate everyone with your Hustle of the Week. Uh, we'll end the Hustle of the Week on that note. All right. So how did you, how'd you feel last week about, you know, Wayne was talking about, I felt like this was the new era, not last week, two weeks ago, new era of selling. That volume is key. Do you think volume is the way to go now? Yeah, I mean, it kind of goes back to what I mentioned earlier. I think the fast nickel, just trying to get things moving is a, is a, is a decent model, right? Like, yeah, if you can source like the highest end stuff, like if, if your model is like I buy like really rare guitars or really rare, you know, car parts, yeah, you're going to be looking for the top dollar on those cuz you're probably going to be one of the few people that have those listed. But if you're just in a saturated market already, look, you, you got two options. Like one, I can list this polo for $45 and hope it sells, or I could just list it for 20 knowing that the going rate is, you know, sometimes they sell for 40, sometimes they sell for 35, sometimes they sell for 20. Like if I list it for 20, I know it's gone by the end of the week or or sooner. And that just keeps me rolling. And if you're buying at a, a cheap enough price, uh, sometimes just the activity alone on eBay or on whatever platform you're on is worth it. And the bottom at the, at the end of the day, like, you know, I was doing my math as far as like, how much do I need to make in order to be, you know, to make my goals, right? It's like, okay, like I need to make X amount each week. Okay, how much, how many dollars in sales is that a day? And you start to do the math on it. And it's like, all right, if I can average $20 net profit on a, on an item, that's only however many items I need to sell each day. And so if that's your route, like you're going to be better off, like just moving quickly than saying like, well, I only have to sell like 10 items, but you know, I only sell, you know, sometimes I sell 10 items in a week because they're higher end and they sell higher, but sometimes I only sell one or two and then you're really stuck. So I, I definitely think there's something to be said about pricing it competitively. If you price competitively, you're going to have to sell more at a higher volume in order to make that profit. But you've got that constant cash flow coming in. It does add a layer of you need to be able to source more because if you're selling Mm -hmm. 40 items a week, you need to be able to source at least 40 items a week or more because you're not going to sell every item you list. So if you're trying, if your goal is sell 40 items a week at an average sell price of $20 an item, then you're going to need to be able to list like 60 items or more a week. So I mean, or list and source that many. So um, there's there's a double edged sword to the volume thing, too, is it's more it's also more of a grind. No, I, I agree. I agree. But I, I again, I, I do think it's the way to go. I think it's hard for a lot of people. It's hard for me. You know, I, I miss the days where I could just sell five items in a day and I'd make, you know, just as much money as I'm making right now selling 20 items. Like it was a lot less work. It was a lot easier. But that's not where we're at now. And I, I'm not sure what that's going to change anytime soon. I do think if the economy picks up, uh, I think it'll change. I think people are going to be more willing to pay up for items. And so, the, you know, that that's going to take us to that level again. But I, I'm not sure when that's going to be. Now, I do think we've reached the era of there are no, there are no, uh, there are not no, there are non-negotiables. And Mike might disagree, but I think the non-negotiables right now 
in reselling, in particular to eBay, is you must do promoted listings, you must do returns, and you must do offers, meaning best offer and send offers. I think those those are going to put you ahead of everyone. If there are people still holding on, hoping there's, there isn't going to be a return, like you're mistaken. Like the other day, somebody messaged me and said, hey, I, I sold this car part. I shipped it out. Buyer said it doesn't fit. Do I have to return it? <laughs> and I was like, yes, you have to accept the return or eBay is going to force the return. So why not make it easier on yourself? Just accept the return. Know that it sold once. It's going to sell again and, and move on. Uh, I'm I'm also leaning more like free returns is going to be. I, I think that's going to be one that's going to divide a lot of people. I think right now I don't have free returns on for everything. If somebody buys something and it doesn't fit or they have buyer's remorse, I won't offer a return on their shipping. Uh, but, you know, I'm also having people now message me after the fact going, hey, you said you had free returns. And I'm like, yeah, but in my rating, it says I don't offer free returns for these scenarios. Well, people are just going to be smart. They're going to adapt and you're just going to change the reason for returning it. You know, so. And then, uh, yeah, and promoted listings. I, I hear a lot of people still saying they're not doing promoted listings. I just don't know anymore. I, yeah. I just I think it's just part of the game. It would be an interesting, uh, an interesting little like experiment to do, like because I can let's say I've got a a ten dollar item and I've got it at ten percent promoted listing, right? Just so you know, it's going to cost a dollar when when this sells, or do I list this item for nine dollars, right? So it, it could go either way. Um, is eBay going to push it up more if it's promoted higher? Is it or is it better just to list it that much lower and then get that sale? It'd be an interesting experiment. Same thing with like uh, 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 running a sale. Like what if you just, instead of running a, a, a 20% sale, what if you promoted it 20% higher? So I, I don't know. That would be an interesting thing, but I definitely think promoted listings is kind of something that must be done. Yeah. Well, I will say eBay did say you're better off doing the sale than doing the 20% promoted listing because you do eventually reach a peak. Uh, but yeah, sales. I, I That's another one I should have mentioned. I think running a sale is non-negotiable. So you know, this is where we're at. This is what we need to do. And, and here's the reality. There's a lot of people making it happen right now. There's a lot of people being successful. And I think right now, a lot of people kind of, you get into the space where you hope everybody's doing just as miserable as you are. So you feel better, but there's a lot of people that are doing really well. And I encourage people, if you're struggling and you're not making it happen, stop listening to those people that are just whining. Um, stop, stop listening to those people that are trying to find ways to hack their way uh, on eBay and going, well, if I, you know, change this keyword here or if I promote at this or if I, you know, if I end up and until similar and do this like and and then it doesn't work. And then they're like, oh, there must be something wrong with eBay. And it's not to say that eBay hasn't had its issues. I've mentioned many times the glitches, the, the problems with eBay. But I, I think you need to find a new crowd. I, I think you, you know. A lot. It's funny because people say we're negative. I don't think we're negative. I think we're we're just keeping it real. But we do tell people like, hey, you know, there are people that are making it happen. And if you find yourself, it's been six months and sales have been terrible and things have been terrible. And you look at your list of people that you're listening to on YouTube and they're just people that are saying eBay is dying or their thumbnail is like eBay is failing or eBay hates resellers, whatever it is. Unsubscribe to all those people. Find new people. Find the people that are saying, "Hey, I, I'm killing it on eBay. Hey, I these are this is what I found on eBay. This is what's working for me on eBay." Watch those people. Listen to those people. Not saying they're right, but you you can't get in a place where all you're listening to is you know what is I I always struggle seeing that word commercialism. What is it when 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 people are cranky and old? Commercialism. Yeah, there's yeah. a lot of commercials out there. <laughs> there. There really are, and, and you, you got to get rid of that. You, you got you got to listen to people that keep you motivated, people that are, you know, showing new bolos, people that are telling you, hey, this is what I'm pricing things at. And I, I think right now in 2024, it's going to be the year of, you know, you need to adapt or you're going to get left behind. That's so, good. You think do you think I'm a little too too harsh here, Mike? No, man, I think you're right. Okay. All right. So, hey, hopefully this episode helped many of you out it is a new era of reselling. And, you know, this is we're looking forward. Like Mike and I are both excited. Uh, we've had many conversations off the podcast about what we want to do, how we want to scale our businesses. And, and we, we're, we're taking it, you know, we've always taken it seriously, but we feel that we kind of coasted for a little bit. And now it's time to actually, you know, 
apply these new things that we're learning ourselves and sharing with other people and and apply it even more and make things happen and so hopefully to help many of you if you haven't yet make sure uh to subscribe or smash that like button hit that bell notification so you don't miss our monday mini shows that are live and with that being said yeah. make sure to be real be relevant and be reselling peace, peace.